Yes, yes, it does. Every week, Brad comes in to talk with us about important stuff, including oil and gas issues and politics surrounding the budget. He joins us this morning uh, for our latest dose and round of discussions. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? I cannot complain, my friend. It's just going to be another beautiful day here in paradise. I appreciate you coming on. So yesterday, Brad, uh, we had a discussion on the program, uh, had a caller call in and wanted to talk a little bit about the oil and gas and the refundable and cashable tax credits. And they were talking specifically about this story about Blue Crest Energy. And it was reported by KTVA and KTOO that they were shutting down. Uh, turns out maybe not quite as long a shutdown as, as some of these stories were purporting. Uh, but somebody wanted to know what I thought about it. And I thought, well, this is just kind of the market writing itself. Because now, instead of getting government payola, they're going to have to go back to the private sector like normal oil and energy companies do and get normal financing for exploration. A- am I wrong? No, no, you're right about that. And it's uh, it's gotten to be a little frustrating. This is this issue... Uh, about what's causing what caused Blue Crest to take a pause, and they've they've consistently said it's a pause. And editorials like Andrew Jensen's in the Alaska Journal of Commerce that talks about the deadbeat legislature not living up to the state's obligations. It, it's sort of become the Alaska version of fake news. Um, the the way the oil gas and and you have to understand the way the oil and gas credit system works to understand why it's fake news. And why all of these all, all of these articles and all of these screams that we're hearing from people are, are, are wrong. The credit system is is very simple. There is a fund that's established by the legislature from which the credits are paid. And this whole statutory scheme has been in the statutes since the day the credit program was established. So nobody's changed the rules. It's the way it's always been. It's the way the, the, the producers and the companies knew it was. When they entered into the when they entered into the, this program, the the legislature established established an oil and gas fund, and the fund is used to pay the companies for the credits, the the certificates that they hold. The key is how that fund is is managed and funded. The state the, there's a statute that talks about it, and the statute says each year the state will contribute to the fund at least. And these are these are important words. At least uh, a percentage of the amount of revenues the state is getting from the production tax. So when production taxes are high, when the state has a lot of revenue, there's a lot of money put in the fund. When production taxes are low, when the state has a low revenue uh, cycle, the amount of money put in the fund is low, and everybody knew that going in. What's happened is during the high years, during, during high revenue years, we were put, the state was obligated to put a lot of money into the fund and to pay those credits, and the credits got paid fairly quickly uh, after, they were, after they were accrued by the producers. And the state, even in, in the years when we had high revenues, even put extra money in uh, and paid even more of those credits uh, uh, quickly. Uh, uh, as, the, as the producers accrued them. But the state had no obligation to put in those additional funds, and, and the statute worked that, that we were putting in what we were required to do when funds were high. Now that funds are low, the state is still putting in, is still complying with the statute, and putting in the percentage that it's required to do. This year, the state's required to put in, FY 2018, the state's required to put in about $77 million. Between right. the operating budget and the capital budget, the state did that. The state's not obligated to put any more in. The only obligation, the only statutory obligation, what the state is obligated to do is to put in that percentage. What's going on is the producers and the companies and, and, and the Alaska Journal of Commerce and others are saying, oh, my gosh, you know, the producers have all these credits. We need to, we need to push a bunch of money into that fund so you can pay off all the credits. Well, that's never been the statutory scheme. The statutory scheme has always been to be just a percentage of whatever revenues the state got in. Essentially, the producers in the program agreed when they entered the program that they would share the risk of low oil prices. If we had low oil prices and declining production, we would have low low production tax revenues, 
low revenues going into the fund. That's all they could claim. So it's, I mean, and, and, and now that we're in that scenario where we have low oil prices and low production and, and relatively low production levels, and so we're contributing low amounts to the fund, the producers want to change the name of the game, right? They want to say, right. well, no, no, right. you need to put in more money now. And that's just, that's just wrong. It's just wrong. Well, and isn't it, it? This is becoming more than anything else. This is becoming almost like a PR war. I mean, the the oil companies have enlisted the help of of, of entities that are friendly to them, including the, uh, the Journal of Commerce and others, to to write these stories from this kind of this slant of, well, that they need to be paid. They've got to be paid. If they don't be paid, then everybody's going to leave. I mean, that's kind of the tone of this story. Even though they do mention in the story that this is only temporary, they're going to pause for a month or two. Uh, they're they're putting these stories out there, and then other mainstream news media outlets are really not looking into it any further, and they're just kind of skimming the surface and 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 kind of portraying the story just just like you laid it out, just like we're not we're not paying our bills, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, the 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 media isn't aren't going to the experts; they're just accepting the press releases and running with the stories from these press releases. What in Bluecrest's case, I mean, you can you can analyze what's going on. What what Bluecrest has done is it the states uh, uh, th these credits are zero cost financing, right? There's no obligation. You don't have interest. You don't have an obligation to pay them back. You don't have an obligation to drill. Uh, you get the credits if you if you do drill, but you get them on the payment schedule provided in the statute. It's zero cost financing. So Bluecrest and others have said, boy, you know, I like this financing, so I'm going to sort of set up my business to be in part dependent on, on that source of financing. Bluecrest kept thinking, I guess, that the state was going to come through with additional money, that, that, that we were going to pay more than we were statutorily obligated to do. Somehow, you know, you cut the PFD, but, but give the oil companies uh, excess money uh, over and above what the statute required. And they didn't go out and arrange alternative financing. They didn't go back into the market because they were they were depending upon these payments, they didn't go back into the market and arrange financing from banks and other lenders that that you would normally use to finance an exploration and, and drilling program. So when the when the credits didn't get funded, or, or when they when we didn't fund excess money into the oil and gas fund, when we didn't pay more than we were statutorily obligated to do, when there wasn't extra for them to 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 have to have zero cost financing. All of a sudden, they said, "Oh my gosh, you know, we don't have enough money to operate, so so we're going to need to take a pause while we go arrange uh, uh, alternative financing." That's all that's going on. The state has always complied with its statutory obligation. Always complied with its statutory obligation. It's complying with its statutory obligation this year. Bluecrest and others just didn't raise, just didn't, just didn't arrange substitute financing uh, when oil prices were low. To cover them, to cover the effect of the state obligation going down. So, you know, when they didn't do that, all of a sudden they hit pause. It happens to be timed about the time that the capital budget gets finished, and people are making the link between, well, capital budget didn't do everything the producers wanted it to, so the state must be short paying, and the state must be, you know, the cause of, of these delays. It's not. The state's not the cause of the delay. It's the it's the it's the fact the producer didn't arrange alternative financing to account for the fact that the state didn't have a higher payment obligation coming into this year. And this is a this is actually a part of a bigger bigger problem and a bigger PR campaign because we talked about this last week. Same kind of PR blitz going on out there an example on the construction industry. Well, the construction industry is being devastated because we didn't fund all these projects in the capital budget. Again, it's because companies built their entire business model based on government largesse and and again I, I just like to say that ain't my problem, Jack. You're the one that built your business model on that. You know, this this is the Republican side. If, if if we if we classify it according to party, this is the Republican side of what the of what the Democrats have done on K through 12 funding and on the university funding. Oh my God, the sky is going to fall in if we don't do you know full full quote full K through 12 funding, which is actually more than the statutory requirement. But if we don't do full K through 12 funding. And if we don't do, you know, university funding, the sky is going to fall in because these right. people are going to have to adjust to the new to the new reality. Well, the Republican the Republican version of that, at least the Republican Senate version of that, is the construction budget and the oil and gas industry. Oh my gosh, if you know, look look at look at what happens now if we don't, you know, continue these 
state subsidies to these programs. In the, and in the case of the oil and gas tax credits, even more than what we're statutorily obligated to do. Look at the consequences of this. It is across the board in this state. We have built industries and we have built uh, uh, public sector jobs, K through 12, university, state, number of state employees. We've built them all on the predicate that funding will continue, will continue on. And, and, and that was never guaranteed. It was never in the statute. It was never an obligation. Now that funding's coming down, we're seeing all these special interests emerge going, oh, my gosh, I've built my business case on, 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 on this particular source of state funding. Wow, what if the state doesn't fund it? What if I've got to go back to the private market? Or in the university case, what if i got to develop you know, private contributors, something that they've never done a very good job at? Or in K-12, what if I've got to cut administration? I mean, yes, you have to do that. We don't have as much money anymore in the state. Right. The state right. doesn't have an obligation to do more than what it's doing. Get real, guys, and adjust to the new economy. Well, and that's, again, that's a, at what point does it become our problem, apparently, right now? I mean, that's what these companies have done. They've pulled all this stuff together, and uh, and now they're they're running this snow job. And in part, it's working because we're seeing what's going on with uh, we're seeing what's going on with uh, uh, the, the capital budget. I mean, they threw more money into the capital budget to pay for some of these things, and then then pointed to the statute and said, "We're just fulfilling the statute." But that's not what the statute says. Yeah, it's it's in some instances it is. I mean, there is there are about forty five percent, fifty percent of our budget uh, operating budget is determined by formulas. And, and these formulas, unless we change the law, these formulas operate to, to, to require, statutorily require, a certain level of funding. Um, and so, you know, to some degree, that's right. But guess what? A, the legislature doesn't always pay attention to those. The, the principal statutory formula uh, in the budget is the PFD. Uh, the PFD says you shall transfer 50 percent of the earnings to the permanent, to the, to the dividend fund so that, so that dividends can be paid. Well, the, the legislature just ignored that this year. They only transferred 25 percent of the earnings, roughly, uh, to the to the to the dividend fund. So, the legislature's proved they, they know how to ignore the statute uh, if they want to. But B, you can always change the statutes. And C, these formulas only determine about 50 percent of the budget. The rest of it is discretionary. So, what's going on is some special interest is getting their funding, and the other special interests aren't. And rather than rather than have a debate about which which special interests, which projects should we be funding and not, the the special interests that aren't are just complaining generally, right? Oh my gosh, you know, I didn't get funded. I need more money. The legislature short paid me when in fact the legislature didn't. Um, and just and just going off on these on these PR rants in a way in a way that's just not true. As I said, this is as near to fake news as we've got going on in Alaska these days. That, that somehow the government short paid the oil and gas producers. Now, in the operating budget, as I mentioned, I mean there was a there was a they bumped up by you know several hundred million dollars. Some money's in there to pay for some of this stuff. So is Bluecrest going to have access to some of this? Are they going to get some of those seventy five million dollar um, in refundable credits that they have? Are they going to get some of that money paid out to them out of that? I, I'm yes, they're entitled to. I'm the, the way that. That fund is is used is first come first serve. So first the first that got certificates in hand are the first ones entitled to the money. I'm sure Bluecrest has got a little bit of it, but but what I think but but what it appears Bluecrest was counting on is getting more funding into that fund, excess funding into that fund, so that more of their claims would be paid. Um, I'm sure they'll get a little bit, but 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 they were counting on more because they were counting on on excess funding going in there, and now they're just going to have to go out and arrange alternative financing. Well, and and that, I think, is the way business is supposed to be done. I mean, you should get it done through traditional means. This picking of winners and losers by government, I mean, historically, has never ended up well. I mean, we could see it right now. We could see exactly what's happening right now, and it essentially is a wealth transfer from the citizens of the state of Alaska to the businesses that the government is now picking as winners in this contest. And that, uh, you know, and they'll they'll spin it some other way. They'll say, well, of course it's not. But it's pretty hard to deny when you see $700 million transferred 
uh, of Alaskan wealth transferred on the one hand to oil companies and $700 million on the other hand taken away from Alaskan citizens, it's kind of hard to dispute that. I mean, whether they come from different buckets of money or whatever, the bottom line is, is if 700 went out and 700 got sucked back, that's pretty much a wash. And uh, and I think people are going to remember that. Well, it's, it's, it's exactly that, Michael. The PFD got cut. A statutory obligation of the state to its citizens got cut in half. Uh, and they're using essentially that money uh, to, to meet other statutory obligations. And, and, and one of those statutory obligations is the producers. Now, keep in mind only, you know, the, this year's allocation is only $77 million. That's what the statute provides. That's what the legislature has transferred. They use other parts of the PFD to fund other things. But, but yes, I mean, they're taking money out of the hands of Alaskans through the PFD cut, and they're redistributing it through government to government-favored entities, to the, to the oil companies in the case of the oil and gas tax credits, to the university, I mean, they're funding the university about $100 million over what the university's peers uh, get from their state. That's the university's own peer-selected group. Uh, and, and elsewhere in government, I mean, the number of government employees has, has stayed relatively constant. They, they are they're taking money out of Alaskans, rede- redirecting it through the hands of government, and government's deciding, you know, who gets to, who gets to, to win, who gets the money, and in the case of Alaskans, who doesn't get the money. Uh, We're talking with Brad Keithley. Uh, Thoughts on Oil and Gas is the name of his blog. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is the organization that he founded. Uh, He's an oil and gas consultant and attorney, former uh, oil and gas consultant and attorney. He's going to be back with us. We're going to continue this discussion on the other side. The Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. Every week, Brad Keithley comes in to join us to talk about oil, gas, politics, and more. We're going to delve down into where Alaska is going as far as revenue and everything else. Uh, but, Brad, right before we left, I, I uh, wanted to talk about it because you mentioned, again, the statutory obligation. And we did have a caller last week, Lynn, who called in to talk about um, th- that specifically. And he's like, they, they're not statutorily obligated to pay the permanent fund. They're statutorily obligated to transfer the money. He wanted to be real clear on that. And that is the truth. But, again, you're mentioning the fact that they only transferred a portion of what they were statutorily obligated to do so. No, they are statutorily obligated to fund the permanent fund. The statute says that the, that the, that the permanent fund corporation each year shall – it uses the word shall, which when lawyers see that word, it means you will do it – that you shall transfer 50 percent of, of the earnings – Over the last five years, calculated according to the statute, you shall transfer 50 percent of the earnings to the to the dividend account. And then another statute says that the state shall transfer, shall shall distribute that 50 percent of the earnings transferred to the dividend fund out of the dividend to Alaska citizens in accordance with the statute. There is an absolute statutory requirement uh, uh, for for the dividend. Absolute uses the word shall there is there is a statutory requirement with respect to the to the oil and gas fund uh, the oil and gas credits but that statute says you shall transfer um, a percentage of the uh, revenues that have uh, the production tax revenues that have come in each year they're, they're equal in that sense they both use the same terminology to obligate the state to transfer funds um, there's nothing about the PFD that makes it any less, any lesser uh, a statute or any lesser an obligation uh, than the oil and gas fund. The state, the legislature is just choosing to ignore it. So I, I, there, I, I would disagree to the, with the argument that one is statutorily obligated and the other is not. They are both equally statutorily obligated. I guess I'm wondering how in the world then the governor thinks and the legislature thinks that they can bypass this. Uh, and have it stand up in court, which, of course, we're going to see this court case is going to play out here in the near future with this discussion. Uh, I'm curious as to how they think that that's going to stand up. I mean, your thoughts on that? Well, the obliga- so, so what they're arguing is all every statutory obligation, every statutory obligation is subject to annual appropriation. So essentially every year the legislature can make up its mind 
whether it wants to fund something or not uh, provided by the statutes. If the, if the courts decide that the PFD doesn't have to be funded, uh, that the word shall doesn't mean shall, that they can each year decide to do something different, then the same logic and the same theory and the same rules of law will apply to the other statutory obligations. So if you argue that, that because of the annual appropriations, the assumption that annual appropriations trumps statutes, if you argue that it trumps the PFD statute, then it also trumps the oil and gas fund. It also trumps the K through 12 BSA. It also trumps the annual Medicaid formula. It, it also trumps uh, school transportation formulas. It also trumps the obligation of the state to fund, to, to reimburse uh, localities for a portion of the construction costs of new schools. There, there's no rule. I mean, essentially, right. there's no law uh, yeah. if, if, if we find that, this, that the PFD doesn't have a law. Yeah, it might be a Pandora's box. If they actually win this, there might be a Pandora's box effect of this, unintended consequences that they didn't really think all the way through, which uh, would be interesting to see. Uh, Brad, I want to get into new revenues and things like that, but I do have a call. Brian is on the phone. He wants us to talk about clarifying how producers access the credits. Brian, uh, explain your question here to Brad. Well, you, you two have... Uh... I guess done a really admirable job explaining how the sort of the credit pool gets funded from the state. I just am interested in how it is that the producers uh, are able to access this to sort of fund their their operations and, and what their obligations are and what they're required and how how it's determined how much gets paid out to individual producers. Sure. So so the the producers. Uh, engage in activity, uh, 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 exploration in terms of seismic or any number of activities uh, or drilling. They engage in activity that's, that's authorized for credits under the fund, that the state says we will, we will provide a credit for this sort of activity. The producer uh, turns in, uh, uh, says he's going to engage in this credit or activity. He gets, pre he gets authorization. Uh, he engages in the activity. He turns in his costs. He gets a certificate that says now you're entitled to recover under the statute, you're entitled to recover the share of cost. Producer comes to the state, presents that certificate, and says, okay, here's my certificate. How much do I get funded? The state looks at the fund uh, and then determines what share that producer has. And as I was saying before, it's first come, first serve. Producers who turn in their certificates earlier or, to, or to uh -huh. do the work early get funded before the, before the later ones. So Producer comes to the state, says, here's my certificate. State looks at the fund, says, well, your share of what we got in the fund is X, and cuts a check uh, to the producer at that point. Now, that share is based on they just add up all the – they add up the all the uh, producers sort of submitted invoices and then percentage-wise divvied out proportionally or – Well, it's first come, first serve. So, so basically the first producer's in – uh, get up to a certain amount uh, from the fund, and then the next producer in gets up to a certain amount from the fund, and the amount is determined based on a number a number of factors. If they turn them in at the same time, uh, and there's, I, I think if you turn them in within a certain period of time, you're deemed having turned them in at the same time. If you turn them in at the same time <laughs> for purposes of the statute, then they each get an allocation. But it, it's always gotcha. based on what's in the fund. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the call, Brian. We appreciate you calling in. Um, all right, Brad. So let's get down into it. We know what's coming. We, we've heard it already discussed. We've seen it. Uh, uh, the APRN uh, 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 and KTOO, that's Alaska Public Radio in Juneau, they had a story up about uh, Senator Dennis Egan. He's speaking to the Juneau Chamber of Commerce the other day. And he, he had some comments to make on new revenues. And uh, his commentary, his, his quote uh, to me was uh, just really chagrined me because his quote essentially said, we didn't make government stable, and that really, really concerns me. We can stop the slashing of state jobs, to which I said, what state jobs? What state jobs are getting slashed? We've got 
thousands and thousands of private sector jobs being lost over the last 24 months with another two or three or 4,000 expected to be cut in the next 12 months. What, where have we seen this slashing of state jobs? And what does that say about our legislators when that appears to be their priority? Yeah, well, Egan Egan represents Juno, right? So, so right. Juno is ground ground central for um, for state for state jobs. So any state job lost is is big news um, in Juno, and he's sort of he's sort of you know talking to his base to his base of of right. of, of, of government sector uh, uh, fueled uh, fueled economy down there. Um, but yeah, it, I mean. But you can hear the same thing when you hear even Kathy Giesel, when you hear Senator Giesel talks about, oh, we've got to, you know, we've got to fund these oil and gas credits. She's talking to her base. Or when you hear, you know, people talking about we've got to fund K through 12, they're talking to their base. Or when you hear Pete Kelly and others talking about we've got to fund the university, they're talking to their base. Every, everybody's got a base out there that seems that, that the way we've grown this government and the way we've grown government spending is dependent on government spending. So. Egan's speech should be repeated throughout the state. They would just fill in the blank with a different, um, you know, we've got to protect the government from being, we've got to protect this sector from being, from being cut. Question is, the question now is all of those, everybody sort of having now a base that they think they need to protect, a government funded base they need to, they think to protect the discussion of we need government, we need new revenues is just increasing and increasing and increasing. You know, uh, Mike Dunleavy talk, says we can live within our means. We can live within. We have. We can have a sustainable, sustainable budget. Shelley Hughes sometimes says the same thing, but but they're the minority. I mean, the majority in the Senate voted to cut the PFD because they needed new revenues. The majority in the House voted to cut the PFD and for an income tax because they need new, new revenues. So if you look across government, the majority is saying there's a need for new revenues. You and I don't think that. Mike Dunleavy doesn't think that. But the majority in in both bodies in the legislature and the governor think they do. I'm and and I'm really concerned about that because again, it seems like the primary focus, and again, goes right back to what you were talking about, the special interests. You know, they've got their they've got their constituency. Egan's got the Juno and and others have construction and then others have oil and gas and others have the university. But it seems like the one constituency that gets lost in this is the people as a whole. I mean, we saw that during the discussions uh, all this last session. There was never, never brought forward any thoughtful analysis of what the impact would be on the private economy with the actions that the legislature was taking. Yeah, a- absolutely right. And, and we're beginning to, we're, be- we're losing that also now as they talk about new revenues. I mean, they're talking about new revenues. Some talk about PFD cuts. The Senate talks about PFD cuts. Uh, and that's the way we're going to raise new revenues. Well, that has a huge adverse impact on both the overall Alaska economy. It takes out of what they have done the last two years, takes out about a billion dollars a year uh, in income out of an economy. It's only got $40 billion to begin with, it takes out two and a half percent of, of, of the overall economy income. And it, and it affects Alaskans, individual Alaska families, hugely adversely. Um, PFD cuts, according to ICER, PFD cuts are the worst step you can take for for Alaska families. So now that we're okay, let's talk about revenues. They're still talking about the wrong thing. I mean, they're talking about things that are going to hurt a lot, the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families worse, uh, the, the worst that you possibly can. So, okay, let's talk about new revenues. I, I, I think the mistake I've made, Michael, and frankly, I would say some others have made is we keep saying there's no need for new revenues, no need for new revenues. And what that's done is, is allow those who are talking about new revenues, and again, it's the majority in the Senate and the majority in the House, those that are talking about new revenues to sort of have a free field uh, about, you know, what new revenues they want. And, and so when we get outvoted uh, by saying, yes, we need new revenues, we, have, we don't have a dog in the game uh, about what the new revenues ought to be. So I think it's gotten to be time that we need – not that we need them – but I think it's time that we need to be talking about new – if we're going to have new revenues, what is the least harmful way to have new revenues? And it's sure not PFD cuts because right. that has a huge adverse impact on the overall economy, has a huge adverse impact on, on Alaska families. And frankly, it's probably not income taxes, progressive income taxes 
either, which which have have effects uh, on 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 the incentives you want for people to develop new jobs and to and to invest uh, and do various things in the economy. I think we're gonna. I think we need to start talking about the options. We're starting to talk about it on this segment. I'm going to talk about it, if you'll let me, on other segments going forward. We need to start working through, if we're going to have new revenues, uh, what new, which new revenues we ought to be, we ought to have. We're Some down to the last sales taxes. Yeah, we're down to the last 90 seconds. So let's summate what you think, where you think it's going, and let's let's finish it up. We need to talk about. We need to start talking about new revenues. PFD is bad. So is income tax. Frankly, I think sales tax is also. What you're going to hear me talking about going forward is a flat tax, just a flat percentage uh, from everybody, including the lower lower income people, just a flat percentage to fund government. I think that has a lot of a, a lot of positive effects uh, in, in the context of having to have it uh, at, at all. Yeah, if you have to have it, you know, if you, if it's a, if it's a must have, which seems to be the pretty much the consensus from everybody out there. And you're right, we're not getting any traction on the. There's no need for a tax. So if you have to have it, this would be the least damaging. And we'll uh, we'll be exploring that next week uh, uh, with you, Brad. Thanks for coming on and joining us. Michael, thanks for having me. Final hour.